This video is the first video in the series of four videos which should be discussing the stage-by-stage -stage transformations that this boy went through. Those stages are taken with several months apart and present different milestones of changes that he had. And I believe it's having the greatest information value because this way we can really zoom in, we can discuss the specifics and we move away from this sort of magic component or the training component and we can really focus on details and understand the nuts and bolts of the transformation. Let me remind the key concept that I've introduced a bit earlier. The three domains of the evaluation, three domains like as a lens through which we look at the analysis of motor functions. The level one, that's the level of segmentation. Very easy to understand. That's a selective mobility of the compartments and elements of the body. Selective mobility of the arms, selective mobility of the head, selective mobility within the trunk, selective mobility of the legs, and so on. So level two could be generalized under the umbrella of weight bearing. The strength and the level of the support that the child needs within the load transfers. So, well does he handle the reaction force, how well he's able to position himself in space, and so on. And domain number three, that's the domain of voluntary function. Purposeful movements, the ability to interact, the ability to use uh, objects, reach for the objects, and uh, the ability to adjust to the changes in the surrounding environment, and so on. The key premise of ABR is that it has to be sequential. Yes, the domain number three benefits from training, benefits from movement intelligence, but it has to be based on the essentials of the first two. The number one, sequential mobility, segmentation, and number two, the sufficient strength, which is maintaining the weight bear. So let's go through the details. Again, the opening pictures, they are the ones describing the maximum level of support, or let's say the level of the support that the channel needs to maintain a position. And again, this is very straightforward understanding. You can see that my arms are, or my hands are placed in the chest area. So that's the level of the maximum support. I'm at the upper chest. Actually, as the evolution what do you want to see? We want to see the level of support, sort of the circumference of support, gradually descending downwards. Because the true seating, the true independent seating, like edge seating in, our, in this particular test, would be the one when the child would not need any of those levels of the support and we have sufficient seating platform to rely on and sufficient counterbalancing above it in order to be able to control his position. Obviously, over here, we're not seeing any of those. So that's the maximum level of support. And another important aspect of this is the general reaction, right? This is a very, very typical hyperextension, right? So you see this combination of fold forwards when the child is relaxed and arch backwards when he tightens up and tries to do something. And of course, please note this characteristic position of his arms, right? And this is the position of his arms, which is being present not only throughout the sitting, but throughout the other placements as well. So let's go through them. And one more nuance that I want to highlight. You see over here, he's being unhappy crying and a lot of parents and a lot of specialists or professionals actually they tend to look at this as the excuse saying or you know what's the if he he is crying that's legitimate that he's unable to do anything i'm sorry but i don't really relate to this healthy child doesn't get incapacitated by crying what is crying at the end of the day and you can see it here very well that it's just the accentuated accentuated respiratory excursion and in his case this accentuated respiratory excursion only aggravates and kind of highlights the existent limitations of movement so in the long run what do you want to see we want to see the control of the position good mood bad mood doesn't matter 
the fundamentals, they have to be there. Elements have to be movable, namely in this case, head has to be movable in the neck level without dragging the rest of the body. Arms have to be selectively movable. Waist level, you know, like space between the rib cage and the pelvis, the child has to be able to adjust in any direction, rotationally, left and right, forwards, backwards. So this is just common sense to understand that all these components have to be present because this is what we see in the healthy children. And without those components, expecting that training alone is going to be capable of overcoming these limitations, these constraints with some sort of signals, I believe it's um, a bit of illusionary and wishful thinking. So, with this in mind, let's go further into the details, right? So, this picture actually is very, very typical as well, right? I'm actually providing even greater level of the support. I'm supporting this boy at the shoulder girdle level, above the chest, right? And even with that, what we're seeing, the head helplessly drops backwards. This is the support by suspended arm. You see, again, that's not working, right? As I give him one arm for the support, that doesn't help him at all in order to improve his positioning. Again, it's very natural, very natural to understand it. I'll just get to this a little bit later, you know, showing you more pictures of this. What I want to highlight now is this fact that those were the views of sitting and the limitations of sitting. But even once we look at his overall performance in supine position when he's lying on his back, well, one doesn't have to be a clairvoyant to understand that his sitting would be very, very limited, simply for the reason that he doesn't have the fundamentals. He doesn't have the selective mobility of the arms. His arms are stuck. His head is stuck. His entire body, you know, is a single unit. And this is another really important picture where you can see the hidden component, the component of the compressional weakness. And again, yes, when one analyzes the performance of a quadriplegic child, naturally the elements that draw the most of attention are the superficial stiffnesses, the tight, spastic, rigid muscles that limit visibly the movements. However, with ABR being non-invasive method, the method that focuses on strengthening, not on forceful release, not on the attempts to outpower those spastic muscles, we do focus on the search for the weaknesses behind those manifestations of rigidity. And all this progress, all those improvements of mobility that you have already seen in this boy and that we'll go through in the description of stages, they all came from strengthening, not from forceful stretching or anything like it. And as I already mentioned before, he was very uncomfortable in any position, not only in the testing placements and now, once we got through the background and the fundamentals behind it, I hope that this is easier to understand. So this is a good example as well. So you see, at this picture, I was supporting him at a higher level, the level that he was somehow like able to at least tolerate, right? As this picture shows. But once I have moved my level of support lower, what we are seeing, we are seeing that that is complete helplessness. And as I change the direction of the movement, we can see this rigidity. Very important nuance. You see, if you look at the legs, if you look at the trunk, if you look at the arms, and if you look at the head, what you are observing, you are observing that all of them stayed in the same fused position as before. None of them moved anywhere specifically, neither in counterbalancing nor even dropping. So you see this position of the head, this is not strength, this is fusion, this is lack of movement. So what do you want to see? We want to see developing mobility and then on top of the mobility and then building strength. So that's another very important difference of ABI approach from the classics, where in the classics training program tries to utilize his existent rigidities and limitations, trying to teach him how to use them sort of for some kind of 
purposeful, intentional applications. But obviously, this is a very, very limited strategy. So, I'm moving to a different direction. This is the tests which are rotational. Rotational tests clearly show the same picture, the same story. As I do the moves, head, trunk and the legs, they all move simultaneously. There is no angular difference between them. A very simple thing to understand. Without angular difference, how could this boy deliver physically any adjustments, any counterbalancing? It's simply impossible, right? Like, like the car with the wheels that don't move cannot adjust, right? Cannot really be driven, even if you put a best driver in. So that's the very straightforward philosophy behind the AB approach. And you can see when I move him by the legs, it's exactly the same story, right? Everything moves as the unit. Please watch the position of his arm, right? It doesn't change throughout this entire movement, right? I move him about, say, 90 degrees, and throughout this entire movement, the arm position remained completely unchanged. And the view from the back is very, very informative. You can see the flatness, flatness, nothing really, like no shapes, no contours, nothing meaningful. Everything just kind of meshed together. And therefore, when we look at the transformation that the child experiences, of course, you know, there are plenty of challenges and one cannot expect things to, you know, to transform, you know, at once. But it is important to realize that it's sequential transformation. We have to see meaningful shapes. We have to see like contours. We have to be able to see the elements. And you can see as I move him, no counterbalancing at all. At all, just a single blow. Whether I move him to the right or whether I move him to the left. And that's another zoom in. And this is another highlight of what I was just talking about. No space for movement, no room for movement between the actual ribcage and the pelvis. And as you, as I highlight here, no meaningful platform to sit on. He just drops. He sits on a single tiny point. Well, obviously, with all these limitations, it shouldn't be a surprise that he can't do much. And these rotational tests, the limitations of the rotational tests, confirms this once again. This is the view from the side, and those of you who are the parents of quadriplegic children, I believe you're going to recognize this, right? This folded chest, dropped head, and when the boy is being moved forwards, what we are seeing, we are seeing incredibly important thing. Lack of mobility in the lumbar region. If we follow it closely, we would see, please look here, right? As I do the movement, the back line doesn't change. Nothing transforms it. See, he stayed equal, the same curve and the same position of the pelvis, the same position of the head, whether he was sitting sort of straight or he was moved forward. So that's lack of mobility. Again, in some children, some children develop like sufficient motor intelligence to have some use of it, but that's still a profoundly negative element because, and then even if it's usable in the earlier stages of life, when the child is lighter, then as the body weight increases, relying on those crutches doesn't help. And this is a zoomed in, like a more detailed view into this deficit and the challenges that he experiences with the support by one arm. And you can see here, I'm helping him with the support, with the suspended support of a single arm, but this is his stronger arm. And please note here that as the arm is being moved, I apologize for the grainy image, it's taken from the video, but you can see how the entire trunk is being dragged with, as a unit. And again, you can see this helpless collapse of the body. Now we're looking at the core fundamentals behind it. The development of a healthy child, or the development of any human being in general, goes from head to toes. That's very, very straightforward. 
So therefore, we do emphasize the importance of the head control in the full sense of that word. Meaning, to start with, we divide these two main domains, right? Domain number one is the domain of mobility. So the head has to be movable selectively. This is not the case here. You see, as I just brought the head backwards and let it go, I didn't do anything challenging. This kind of position would never challenge a healthy person. Because you see what I've done, I've just brought the head backwards. And if there weren't any limitations within the neck, what would have happened? The head would have stayed. But what is taking place here? The head springs forwards, shoots like out of the catapult. And as I repeat it, whether he's in the good mood or in the bad mood, that's what happens. You can see this is very important picture, right? As the head is being moved, the arms are being dragged. And that's what we emphasize. That's what we want you to look at as a parent when you analyze the challenges experienced by your own child. To understand that there are these fundamentals at the level of the segmentation that present the major constraint and of course on top of this is the level two the weakness so these are the two components first of all segmentation second development of the strength together they give the weight bearing control and only on top of this weight bearing the specifics of voluntary function could develop so as a general overview several points to remember no segmentation equals no ability to counterbalance key limitation of any sitting whether or whatever with whichever intensity of training or teaching or incentives no counterbalancing not much to expect simple conclusion number two happy or unhappy those fundamentals they have to be present number three the child needs this segmentation in all directions. Rotationally, left and right tilting, and backwards and forwards. All of them are important. All of them have to be present. All of them form the basis of the sitting form the basis of counterbalance and the last but not the least component is the seating platform itself without the proper seating platform it is impossible to control the position typically with most of the quadriplegic children we see two typical negatives either it's being positioned and placed on the back of the leg or being placed on the back of the pelvis. So it's sacrum sitting or back of the leg sitting. None of them is right because with the back of the leg sitting, what happens if the child moves? Then basically what happens is any muscular reaction immediately just throws the child off, right? And I guess it's easier to understand that sitting on the sacrum, sitting on the back of the pelvis is simply unrealistic because it's impossible to get the balance. So these are the key elements to remember and I hope that you got a good overview of it so that as we go to the next stages you'll be able to follow the steps and the transitions that this boy has been experiencing. Thank you. Let's proceed to the next part.